let me welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the fourth slot of the study of the book of Agai. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, by which every knee should bow, we approach your presence with creditable trust and confident assurance that you are here before us. So breathe upon every spoken word, every word that to be heard, and all the discussion this moment, as we dedicate everything to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Welcome. We have just two, we have just nine verses of scripture to read from the second chapter of the book of Agai, a two chapter book. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Agai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnants of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw the house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now, take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord, take courage, O Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priests, take courage. All you people of the land, says the Lord, work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you, fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those nine verses of scripture, they are talking about one theme that we want to examine within the scope of half an hour or so. In the eagles, ascent of God's blessing. The eagle is a bird of prey with very good eyesight and soaring ability. It can go between 10,000 to 20,000 feet above sea level, higher than domestic flights. And you can, the ascent is an, is an act of climbing or going up. So we are talking about being in eagle's ascent of God's own blessing. And when God decides to bless you, is, is an act of asking or receiving divine favor, protection. It can be, it can be multi-potential. By way of introduction, through the prophet Jeremiah, the return of Israel's captives would happen. Jeremiah said it long ago, God inspired it to be tacked with the temple's construction for which the second returnees by default attracted God's reactive judgments, coded statements. God decided to send Cyrus, when they were food dragging, God judged them for about, you know, after, after waiting for them for about 16 years. So this study is focused on issues of God's blessings when all is well between him and his elect in the eagle's ascent of God's blessing. See this splash of recordings. You see, a timetable of interactions between God and the Jewish returnees around 520 BC could be summarized in the following clips. It happened around 520 BC, precisely in the 1st of June. God's message to the people will be assessed. The people's reaction will, and the outcome will be focused on just this one page. The foot dragged for 16 years and God cost them. He cost their land. He said in chapter one, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon mountains and upon the corn and upon the 
new wine and upon the oil and upon all that which the ground bringeth forth upon men, upon cattle, upon all the labor of the hands. It was terrible after this thing yet. God can be patient. The land was caked and dry and fragmented. Trees dried up. He said, you brought in money, I blew it away. We got done with that in study two. But we are now coming to people's reaction. Credited to Second Chronicles, which they knew before they went to captivity, if my people, which are called by my name. God said that one on the day of dedication of the temple to Solomon, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and will heal their land. They didn't do it, their land was cursed and not healed. But again, I was saying, God's message, people's reaction. This time it was positive because God's message to them met with some frightful obedience and awe. And the prophet was saying to them in chapter one, verse eight, go up to the mountains. And Israel is a, is a desert. Wood is, is like gold. Go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it. And I will be glorified, says a lot of hosts. When you're hearing a lot of hosts, which happened about two, three, four times in the passage I read, that means God who can fight. You go and do that. Some people call it projects Agai 1-8. Go. Somebody once said, the Holy Spirit is a counselor. He's not a doer. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God will persuade you. He will not do it for you. Go. He's not a doer. He's a, he's a counselor. He's an advisor. Go up. So project Agai 1-8. But as soon as God saw their hearts, as soon as God saw their penitence, he held out. We are still talking about fruit yielding obedience to God. Haggai 1, 14, 15. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the governor. He stirred up the spirit of the high priest, you know, the head of the temple. He stirred up the spirit of the remnant, all in blue. Governor, pastor, people. And they came and walked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. They took the spirit of God, not as counselor, not, not as advisor, but, eh, but now they, they, they went to the doing. The doing is your part. And it was dated around three weeks on the 24th day of the sixth month, directly first of the month, action three weeks later. So God is thrilled when we respond to his work and he joyfully helps out. And one the thing, if you can see this squeezed photograph, on the left side of it is Solomon's temple, all plated in gold. What they have just finished is, is block work. Those who saw the beginning will say Ram Shaku. But see God's reaction. Who of you is left? Who saw this house in its former glory? Which of you is 70 years and above? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Sometimes when, when you are short and mourning, what God is judging is your intention and action. Doesn't this seem to you as nothing? But as far as God was concerned, he was pleased. So it, the prophetic came out from Agai. Does it not look at nothing? See Solomon's temple on the left on top. See what you have just finished, like you have just started your five-way consortium, and God is going to do this in 500 years, Eros temple. That's what he's going to do. So God now said, be strong, and now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heavenly army. So the next thing was to take courage. When God sees your positive aspect, see the big hand talking to Israel from nowhere. Be strong. God will encourage you. God will inspire you, but God will not do it for you. We are to do be the doing, he is to be the, he is to do the counseling. So what next? My spirit remains, he put it in the present continuous. My spirit remains with you. Since I brought you out of Egypt, I'm still your God. 
exile, notwithstanding, my spirit remains with you. So when you are a child of God, I have been battered and buffeted. Don't think God has traveled. My spirit is with, still with you. You retain him in obedience. Fortune will come. This is what the Lord of hosts Almighty says. In a little while, you know, when an eternal God is talking, time is nothing to him. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the land. He moves the fortune. The pound is almost one dollar now. He moves the fortune of the entire galaxy in the sun. I'll shake everything. Can you see this? That express road. I will shake all nations around Israel. I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with my glory. Once you are obedient to God, you become the center of attraction of the whole world. He does not take time. It can be ministry. It can be anything. I now reminded them the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. When you hear the Lord of hosts run, it's God who can fight. It's God who can shake anything out of your hand and give to another person. It's, best, it's the God who can tell, put you from penury. Go and see most of the politicians. They were nothing. Everything is mine. And Abraham had that relationship with God. It is true that God's ways are not ours. He took God over 400 years to take action against Israel's Egyptian enslavement. God is not, he had told Abraham before it happened. So don't think anything happening now is just by mistake in God's hand. He told Abraham, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Many times we don't even know, we cannot, many times you pray, you interpret in your own way what you are going through. It's only God who knows exactly everything. You are praying now, but God says, these people sinned. You know, they have not yet come to their full measure. They are going out, but until they reach a certain limit, the patient God will not ask. And it did happen in Exodus 12, 40. The time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 400 and 30 years. That's the fourth generation. And at the end of 430 years, to the very day, to the very day, not one day after all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land, he's able to do it. My Lord is able, is able, is more than abundant able. Let's come to Jeremiah's prophecy. And Jeremiah in his time was saying, this whole land shall be a desolation. They couldn't believe it. They were, they were, they, they thought somebody had bribed him from Babylon. He shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And this nation shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. When he preached holiness and things, they will not answer him. The bombshell came. And when the temple of when the when the rebuilding of the temple will come from exile, Ezra prophesied it. So the elders of the Jews continue to build and prosper under the preaching of Agai and the prophet Zechariah. These are the two people who have done Zechariah. They finished the building the temple according to the command of God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, one emperor, Darius, one emperor, Artaxerxes, king of Persia. He took three emperors to get it to the limits. And Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by mind nor my power, but my, my spirit says a lot of us. When you become, the closer you are to God, the more humble you become. You can never tell how you do anything. And he put in this continuous present tense, my spirit remains among you. For future guarantee of regain glory and blessing, he publishes attributes according to following. He is a God who remembers. That's the first thing I want you to know. By the time we are talking about his blessing, he is a God who remembers and is committed to promises. Many times when God talks to me, he said, go and ask your parents what I told them about you. He is a God who remembers promises. Maybe by that time, they were looking for children who will stay, who will not die. He is a God who remembers promises. My spirit remains among you, do not fear. And you can see this symbolic photograph of the eagle 
because we're talking about the ascent of eagles' blessings. He told them in Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings. That's where the eagle trains its child. I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. How could God put two million people on foot out of a land? No casualty when there was to be a fight. He brought them from the Red Sea on eagles, fed them for 40 years. They did not go sick, except they weren't being punished. Gave them water to drink. And they said, the rock that followed them was Christ. Sometimes they will see 12 wells. Sometimes they will see when the water is the bitter, they will see the pure. He brought them on eagles. Wind. They went in 40 years miraculous. So he's a God who remembers and is committed to promises. Whatever it will take, nothing can. He remembers his commitments. When he was talking to them in, in, in Sinai, he told them in their condition. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. Can you see those when they are doing, when they are collecting bales of hay, those are like countries. Everybody, everyone is mine, but when I say my own possession, you'll be distinguished. That's where God distinguishes ministries. And he did tell them that Exodus 19, 6, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. Priests are people who intercede before God. Can you see on eagles' wings, on eagles' answers, God is right, ready to carry you that, that much. And he reminded them, he's a God who owns all things. The silver is mine. A guy, two eights, and the gold is mine, declares a lot of, he remembers promises, is a God who owns all things. And Psalm 24 com, you know, confirms it like that, but globe, the earth is the loss and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein is a God who owns all things. He owns all, he, he is a God who remembers his promises, is God of blessings, is God who owns all things. When you now see him talk with a 500 year stretch, he saw the Solomon's temple 70 years behind, he saw the Ram Chakul and he was thanking them for building it. And he said, is it not nothing, but I will be with you. And he was promising them for a 500 future, which Aaron was going to construct, that will take 46 years, grand style. He owns future. And when he now told them in Agai chapter 2, verse 7, he said, I will once again shake the heavens and the sea and the dry land. We shake all the nations, and what is desired among the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory. That house is only left, that you call the wailing wall. Thousands of people go there every, and they are making between one to two billion per year. Even the all, only one wall is left. All you are seeing, that one you are seeing is the mosque beside it. He said, I will shake the whole nation. Is number four he is a God who rearranges wealth to gather in any direction. He told them 500 years before Jesus Christ came till today, Israel is not a poor nation. People are trooping to it. He rearranges wealth, the silver is mine, Agai 2.8, the gold is mine, says a lot of hosts. So we are talking about God who has many, many. He's also the God of restoration. He's the God of restoration, Agai 2.9. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. He's the God of restoration. And in this place, I will give peace. I will give prosperity. He's the God of restoration. Don't give up, somebody says. For as long as you're still alive, don't give up. God can still restore you. He's got Zechariah 2, 5. Zechariah and Agai, they are contemporary prophets along the same line. I will be to her a wall of fire all around. You may feel naked, but God is with you. If he says he's with you, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in our midst. Tell me where security is. If it's not with God. 
And when Isaiah was prophesying about restoration, he even went beyond structures. He talked about Jesus Christ. To us, a child is born. He put it as if it already happened. And it was to happen around 500 years after that prophecy. Or a child is, sometimes you see a revelation, you want to go to the next house and say, yeah, this is where God said I will have something. To us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah said it before they all went to captivity. And he went on, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over this kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. And a capital, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. In other words, you may be seeing war, you may be seeing terrible things. God says, I will do it. And Jesus Christ, Christianity is expanding in the authority, in power, regardless of the in order of the terrible things. He is the God of restoration, Isaiah 6 12. The I will, I will extend peace to her like a river. And the wealth of the nations like a flooding stream. God promised it through Isaiah. He promised it through Zechariah. He promised it through our guy. He is still doing it today. And we are all witnessing Israel is not a poor nation. And like our memory verse will be, our guy 2 9. In this place, I will give peace. He said, I will give prosperity. And when he says, I will give prosperity, he's talking about wealth. He's talking about success. He's talking about profitability. He's talking about affluence. He's talking about riches. When God prospers you, and everything in your hand will simply just do well. The, 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 the opposite is the thing never to hope for or pray for. Now let's come. Let's change gear. To get to the level of God's ascent, to get to God's blessing ascent, you need waiting upon him in obedience. It doesn't come like that to, to now say, I, I promise it, I promise it, I, I catch it, I catch it. It does not come like that. To. It's a conditional thing. See the angry, eagle's wind that can span its feet. It's only those who wait. Oh, oh, oh. It's meant for those who are ready to wait upon him. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Very, very conditional. The general conditional is those who wait for the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord, they say like, be like Manzara. Always parallels of heights. In the eagle's access of God's blessing, we're now becoming more personal. Have you discovered this God of blessings? Isaiah 62 says, I've created all the world, but this is the man to whom I will look. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit, who tremble at my word. Some of us, we, we dare him. Somebody will say, I will pray and fast. I know God will forgive me. That's not how to be a Christian. How have you discovered this God of blessing? In the eagle's ascent of God's blessing, personally, asking you once again, as we come to the two thoughts through before discussion, have you discovered this God? We are talking about the wide road where everybody is going through. The narrow road, the people say only very few discover it. Have you discovered this God of all blessing in obedience? That's the word. You discover him in obedience. I like the way somebody has put it. He says, closeness to God is not about feelings. Oh, I love you, Lord. No. Closeness to God is not about feelings. It's about obedience. It's about obedience. And let's put it, let's move to the Bible quotation in a circular way that one Jim George said, just said it. Obedience to God 
will bring blessings to you and others. When God blesses, when you become obedient, the blessings that will come your way will affect others positively. On the way they were running Elter Skelter on Mount Sinai, when it thundered, when there was earthquake, when every when was, was lightning, when there was trumpet sound, when they ran that ran Elter Skelter and said, Moses, speak to us, don't let God speak to us. God replied them with the words quoted in Deuteronomy 5:29. Oh, that they would always have hearts like this, that they might fear me and obey all my commandments. Mark that one, not most, not some. That they will fear me and obey all my commandments. When you do that, the next statement is yours. If they did, they and their descendants will prosper forever. Eli said, it is the Lord let him do what pleases him. He terminated all his descendants' prosperity with him. When you are obedient to God, your generation will prosper by it. If they did obey all my commandments, their descendants will prosper for they and their descendants. So the destiny of your children and grandchildren are in your hand. If you mess up, they will cry when you have gone. And not only they, third and fourth generation. One rabbi, that's the name, looks more like uh, German. One rabbi, Craig Hashback, puts it in the figurative. Obedience is the key to God's heart. When you can obey, wow, you have the key to God's heart. He will just, he will just relate with you as if, as if you are the only one who knows his weakness. Before you ask, he will answer. When you are very you will hear. Obedience is the key to God's heart. If you obey small, you disobey small, the revelation says, I will push you out. Courage, brother, do not stumble. Though your path, you see, you cannot see what courage we need. God can tell you, follow me. And where he is going, there doesn't seem any, 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 any support. Let me sing the, the first verse to you. Courage, brothers, do not stumble. Though your path be dark as night, there is a star to guide the humble. Trust in God and do the right. Oh, you need to know what it means to obey God. God will say something as if it's a suggestion. God does not have a suggestion. He has a directive. It's only children of God who will be taken to heaven for a glimpse. And say, God, I don't want to do that. He just will shut up. We don't disobey here. Can you see as if you are, that's the way Christianity is, my dear brother and sister. It's like you are walking on a rope of 30 meters. You respond to ovation, you crash. You respond to booing, you crash. Follow him, he's tough. And when he just goes, whoever will gain his life will lose it. Whoever will lose life for my sake will gain it. This is what Christianity is. They build a ramshackle. Is this nothing in your hand? But for what you have done, I will do my best. So in the eagle's ascent of God's blessing, watch this statement very well. It's almost a sermon on his own. Don't go outside of obeying God to get something. Because you have to stay outside of God to keep it. You steal to get rich without, uh, what is it called now? Restoration. You, 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 when you get something outside God, you will not be able to retain it except outside him. It's like some people do this thing this way. You are using canal, canal way to raise fun in the church. You cannot use this to make your youth mature. Canal way of getting things will retain canal popularity, not God's popularity. So don't go outside obeying God to get something. You will have to stay outside of God to keep it. And that is the problem between obedience small. So people will go for prostitution and come and do thanksgiving. Because marriage has not come. In the ego's ascent of God's blessing, have you discovered this God of all blessing obedience? Let us talk a little bit about Gideon. Gideon was the one who monstered an army with courage after, after destroying his father's 
after destroying his father's uh, idols, he told God, God gave him sign. He still needed, his heart was still in his mouth when he will have to obey God or disobey him. The Lord said to Gideon, the people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites who are like the sand of the ocean, to give the Midianites in their hands. Let Israel vaunt themselves against me saying, my hand has done it. God does not want to share his glory with anybody. Can you see? 22,000 soldiers reduced to 10,000 soldiers, reduced to 300 warriors. Soldiers are professionals. Warriors are people who don't run away from war. He reduced 22,000 to 300. Now announced to the army, anyone who is afraid can turn back and go, can leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. If you are afraid, go. Hey, thank God. Like Russian composite army. And the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many with these 10,000. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go and who will not. Then Gideon took his warriors down to the water. The Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In another group, put all those who kneel down and drink water with their mouth on the stream. He got 300, yeah? And the number of them that lapped, put in their hands, who used their hand as cup, they were 300. But all the rest who drank like dogs, they go. What is he saying? Can you not see? With these 300, the mighty God is too wonderful. The war was in the night. Thousands, if not caught to million, were the median nights. And yet the three complaints, he divided in them into 100 in three directions, giving them lights, giving them trumpets. And they shouted, they sought for the Lord and for the Gideon and stayed there with their lights and trumpets. That was the signal that heaven needed. And when the, they blew the trumpets, the Lord said the sword of one against another. Even throughout the whole army, they just started killing themselves. They did not know where to go to. Night. The army fled as far as all those one Bethsita towards Zera, as far as the edge of Abelomeola by Tabra. Those things mean something, but I will show you the map. That's the way they fled, the red light, the red arrow. But see where it all happened. Up there around the Israel Valley was where, where the red is. That was where the 300 armies were. Up there, Asher, Zebulon, Naphtali, Manasseh, the tribes that surrounded them, they have sold them to go back. And the military from Opera Jezreel Valley could only go down. Midianites were running down Bechita, Abelomola. Ephraim stood against them, where you see that Gemetra, and the army split into two, some could not go beyond. They started killing them there. And when they got to Kako, the military was everybody now, the whole nation was chasing them. Imagine millions of soldiers who have nowhere to run to. Those who had not gone home, everybody was not killing them along the way. That is the God of battle. How you would do it, you never could. But this is the only way I know. In the eagle's ascent of God's mercy, it's good to be on his side. So be one of Gideon's 300 men. Be one of them. Have you discovered that God of all blessing and obedience? His obedience that opens the padlock that the enemy has locked your gates. First Chronicle 15. And in Ishabi, that's another battle where, where David went to. He gave him a sign. He said, you don't move. But when you hear the marching, have you ever seen marching army on top of trees? In the tops of Marlborough tree, popular seas, then you shall go out of, for battle. For God has gone out to you to strike the host of Philistine. He did it. This is a splash of frame. On the left, you can see Manasseh, Ephraim, you can see Benjamin. It's happened around Benjamin. And 
person do you want to write down? David did just as God has commanded him, and they struck down the army of the Philistines from Gibeon. Here you see on, ben, under Benjamin, you see Gibeon as far as Gaza. They are just killing them, Kiria Jembala. When you see the little Benjamin in the middle of Israel, when you see how you will you listen for margin of soldiers on top of trees, God will give you something that looks, that looks foolish. Many times, he will make you take decision that the whole world will say you are mad. What he needs to get out of you is obedience. Leave the rest to him. How about Joseph Fats? In Second Chronicles 2020, Second Chronicles 2020, they left for the desert of Tekoa, and they set out. The other stood, said, "Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in the prophets, and you will be successful." It can be a hard thing you know, to depend on what God is saying because God has a way of saying foolish things sometimes. And after consulting the people, see the way they fought the battle, Joseph had appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. Give thanks to the Lord for his love and deals forever. That's the chorus. That's the weapon. What happened? See the three nations fighting them, the Ammonites, the center of laws, the Moabites, the second born, you know, the first second born of Lot, they are the one nation, Edomites, that is the, the twin brother of Jacob. Those three nations conglomerated and they were planning to attack, to cross and to attack Israel around again. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushes against the children of Ammon, those are the Ammonites, Moab, the one in the middle. And Mount Seir, Lord's descendant, Edomites. Sorry, he was the twin brother of Jacob, who had come against Judah and they were struck down. The Bible says in verse 23 the men of Amnon and Moab, Amnon and Moab, the first of all, faced each other. The men of Amnon, the men from Mount Seir, the men from Amnon and Moab, they rose to destroy the Edomites. And that's right. They went to Mount Seir, those are the Edomites, to destroy and heal them. After they have finished slaughtering, the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. They faced themselves. Sometimes, I don't know if you remember how much we have been surrounded, we have been slaughtered. We have no power in the army. We have no power in the police. We are surrounded. AK-47. We just say, God, let them face themselves. It's happening. So, praises. One of the battles of the Lord is unique and special and effective with praise. It brings joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Praise and worship bring confusion to the enemy. Take your position and you will defeat the enemy. No matter what prongs. Is there around roses? Give thanks. You will harvest the flagrant of roses and not be hot with the spikes. In the ego's ascent of God's blessing, still a personal question. Have you discovered God's blessing in obedience? Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapon of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. In God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing everything, every thought into captivity to obey Christ. What is the weapon of our warfare? Most of them is the word of God. When you are speaking the word of God from, can you see this, this diagram, this photograph? The only weapon to us comes to turn and is demons, the word. Luke 19, Luke 10, 19, I've, I've, you know, he said, I've given you power to tell about sapiens. In all things, God gives thanks, Romans 8, 28. First Peter, be sober, be vigilant. When you are examining scriptures, these are the canons. As when you're a child of God, they are like fire. So before we start discussing, 
The Bible is saying, when your obedience is complete, is when God will take action. God is ready to avenge you, to avenge all disobedience against you when your own obedience is fulfilled. This is the way God acts. And with this, Eros Temple that came 500 years later, our memory verse is like 500 years vision. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give prosperity. In other words, I'll give wealth, I'll give success, I'll give profitability, I'll give affluence, I'll give riches, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, he has a power of, he has a power of ability to make it come true. When he has a lot of hosts, he doesn't need any power outside himself to make it come to pass. 